Hi, and welcome to Gemini Network Open Live. I'm Seth Kruger, digital media editor of Gemini Network Open. Uh, unfortunately, Angel of the out sick today, so you've got me alone. Um, and of course, follow, follow along on all the usual social channels. If you are following along live, send me questions at Gemini Network Open on Twitter or put the questions in the comments under the video box on Facebook or YouTube. Our first paper today is Trends in the Adoption of Robotic Surgery for Common Surgical Procedures by, by Drs. Kyle Sheets, uh, Jake Claflin, and Justin Dimmick. Unfortunately, the authors couldn't join us today because they got scheduled in a surgery. Um, surprise, surprise. Uh, sorry, Sur surgeons operate uh, in weekdays, it turns out. Um, so this is an interesting study. They looked at, they used the, um, let me get the name of it, the, the Michigan Surgical Quality Collaborative, uh, which is 73 Michigan hospitals and blue cloth. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Um, they've been in a partnership in Michigan before. We've, we've used papers from this collaborative before. Um, they cover about 90% of all surgical procedures in Michigan in their database. What's really interesting here is that they actually looked at the clinical data, not just the administrative data, um, to look through uh, this, the surgeries by type, uh, basically classified them as open, laparoscopic, or robotic. Um, one of the interesting things here that I learned uh, is that robotic surgery is not specifically paid for by Medicare, um, so billing uh, data can be really um, can be really incomplete. Basically, um, interestingly, also if they started off as a robotic surgery uh, and then they they move to open for whatever reason, they continue to clause, uh, go by the original choice, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then basically, uh, they looked at a few different things that happened during the study period from 2012 to 2018. Um, there were 32 hospitals that had already started uh, doing robotic surgery and another 23 of the 73 that started doing robotic surgery at the time uh, during the study period. Um, they, uh, they then basically figured out when each, uh, each hospital started doing robotic surgery and kind of standardized on their graph, which we'll show in uh, figure two for, for what happened with the rates of surgery. Um, they covered a total of 169,000 patients at the 73 hospitals during the uh, six and a half year study period. Interestingly, cholecystectomy uh, was the most common. Um, not only, it was 37% overall, and also had a pretty big increase from 2.5% to 7.5% of robotic surgery use. Um, a couple, overall, the uh, they were just looking at general surgery procedures, um, and they went from 1.8% to 15.1% of robotic surgery. Robotic surgeries went from 1.8 to 15%, which is an 8.4-fold change. So a pretty big increase uh, during that study period. Um, and some really big, uh, if, if you look at the different uh, subtypes, the hernia repairs went up a ton from uh, inguinal hernia went from 0.7 to nearly 29%, and ventral hernia repairs went from 0.5 to 22% um, done robotically. I didn't even realize they were doing these robotically, which is really interesting. And, and really, most of the money's in figure two here. And figure two shows the rates... Uh, the rates of open surgery kind of going down and flattening out after they introduced robotic surgery there and laparoscopic, uh, you know, continued its its ongoing trend of increasing and kind of leveled off as well. And you can see robotic surgery on the upswing there and the light blue. Um, and one of the things that's that, that the authors bring up and talk about is, as really the most concerning here is there's not a lot of data that robotic surgery is better or safer or leads to better outcomes for patients. Uh, the surgical robots are fairly expensive, uh, so somebody's paying for it. Um, and it's just really interesting. I'd say, from what I know, from what the authors have uh, wrote here, and and what we what we've um, talked about is just basically concerns that are we just doing more expensive things because we can. Um, the uh, other things here, yeah, it's it's um, one of the things uh, the authors note too is that you know a lot of these are switching from laparoscopic to robotic, so they're already minimally invasive. Um, and as one of the authors put it in an email to me, it is also unclear what limitation of laparoscopic surgery the robot addresses. Um, the flip side of things, I think sometimes, even if there's no, if all things being equal, if there's no difference in cost, no difference in complexity, um, there's, I think a lot of times, difficult. it's very difficult to pick up some of the intangible things. I've talked about this before with entitled CO2 in uh, procedural sedation, where I think that there, there's a bunch of great studies showing that there's no real main differences in, in clinical outcomes, or you're going to detect more um, more respiratory depression, but it's also clinical, and is it really making a difference? Um, but but for me, when I'm doing procedural sedation, having the entitled CO2 just makes it really easy. Uh, I can just look up quickly, and within a second, know if the patient's breathing or not. It just really kind of cuts a lot of the potential stress from the procedure and it's really hard for that to get picked up in the study. 
Um, that being said, you know, for end title, it's not a lot of money to get them on the monitors. We're using them for a bunch of different things. And it's like $8 worth of plastic uh, to use it on that individual patient. Whereas the surgical robots are pretty complicated, pretty expensive, require a fair amount of training, et cetera. Um, so it certainly raises a lot of different questions. Um, and the authors also note they, uh, the, on that laparoscopic versus robotic, uh, a JAMA surgery paper they recently published, uh, which showed that um, cholecystectomy, or excuse me, robotic colectomy was replacing more laparoscopic cases than open cases by nearly twofold. Um, so certainly pretty interesting. There's apparently 600,000 uh, robotic surgery cases in 2017, according to the robotic device manufacturers, um, which is, I guess, the best estimate we have. Um, the authors also suggest that, um, you know, Medicare is at some point probably going to pay for robotic surgery um, and potentially hinging that on uh, provisions for evidence development, kind of like phase four trials would be interesting. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I don't know. This is interesting stuff. I'm not a surgeon. I don't want to, uh, you know, comment too much on the difference between different surgical approaches. I will say I would love to spend some time just playing around with a surgical robot, not on a real patient, um, but just doing things like folding uh, airplanes or peeling a grape. Sounds like a lot of fun um, and like a real expensive video game. Um, also going to welcome Charles Liu. Welcome. Uh, we just talked to her. I just talked about robotic surgery uh, and increasing rates in Michigan. So great study. Thanks, Dr. Sheets et al. Um, Moving on, next paper is the Association of Deceased, of Deceased Donor Acute Kidney Injury with Distributed Graft Survival. Um, so basically, there are, uh, it, it turns out that a lot of patients uh, who, or a lot of people who die and become kidney donors um, had acute kidney injury during their, their course of illness that led to their death. Um, what they did in this paper uh, was look at the donor net and organ procurement and transplantation network data uh, from 2010 to 2013, looked at the patient's creatinine on admission and then the highest creatinine on their data nephrectomy to find whether or not they had AKI or acute kidney injury defined as at least an increase of 50% um, or uh, 0 0.3. Uh, they propensity matched these these donors uh, to people without any acute kidney injury. They had 6,722 in each group. Uh, they ended up donating most of them donated two kidneys, so they ended up being there ended up being 25,000 um, kidneys that were donated, um, or 25,000 recipients. Um, about 70% had stage one, so just a 50 to 100% increase in the creatinine. 20% had stage two, so a doubling up to a tripling, and 10% had stage three, which was uh, basically more than a 200% increase. Um, and those without acute kidney injury were more likely to successfully donate both kidneys, not surprisingly. Um, there were some differences, mostly in delayed graft function, so 29% versus 22%, um, with a kind of a, a dose response in the, in the AKI stage. Um, but overall, there were similar GFRs in, in the recipients. Um, all the really kind of all-cause uh, outcomes of kidney function were, were pretty similar, uh, things that matter. If you look at figure two, there was a, just, just kind of big heterogeneity in how different um, organ, organ procurement organizations kind of grade kidneys and what they end up using. Or sorry, the grading is the same, but what they decide to do, whether or not to use um, kidneys for the acute kidney injury. Um, and by their estimates, uh, about half of non-transplanted kidneys, about 5,000 of the 10,000 kidneys that uh, could potentially be transplanted, ha uh, had some level of AKI. Um, and potentially, I mean, these data suggest is basically the argument that we could safely be donating these kidneys. Um, it just there'd be a slightly higher rates of delayed graft function, so a little more dialysis while they're waiting for their kid for their new kidneys to work. Um, so interesting stuff. Uh, I and mean, I think anything we can show to say that uh, we can use more organs better uh, seems to be helpful if it's helping out patients. Um, so definitely interesting stuff. Let us know your thoughts. Moving on, um, staying in the realm of nephrologists with uh, some hypertension management, but in the primary care world, um, this next paper is the Association of Physician Education and Feedback on Hypertension Management with Patient Blood Pressure and Hypertension Control. So this is a paper from the Swedish Stroke Prevention Study, um, which was an interesting healthcare intervention directed at primary care providers from 2001 to 2009 in Sweden. Um, there were three main phases. First, in 2001, they started an EHR decision support that included hypertension medication recommendations. Uh, in 2004, they started doing lectures on uh, antihypertension medications at, for the primary care docs and their practices. Uh, and in 2007, they started basically this quality feedback uh, initiative. Um, it gets pretty complicated. Basically, the way they compared counties um, with control counties and intervention counties, they had uh, 
136,000 individuals um, in the in the um, intervention counties, uh, which ended up being 743,000 participants and 108 cohorts compared to the 146,000 individuals or 841,000 participants in the control counties. Uh, basically, lots and lots of Swedish doctors. Um, welcome, Aldine Bojak. We're talking about Swedish uh, uh, blood pressure control interventions. Um, uh, the patient averages was about a mean age of 65 with the mean blood pressure in the low 140s over 80. Um, and basically, they got two-year follow-up from the study uh, from the end uh, of about 83% of patients. 75% um, of patients had hypertension already when the study started or when they were enrolled in the study. Um, and they had data on about 9 out of 10 of them. So overall, you can see what happened to the blood pressure um, in figure one. Blood pressures went down, uh, went down a little more in the intervention groups. Um, and hypertension control went up by about uh, 8% or so um, in the control group, in the intervention group, excuse me, versus the control group. Um, and, basic, uh, and basically their adjusted odds ratio was 1.3 for better hypertension control in the intervention group. This isn't really surprising um, that we're going to um, find, you know, if, if you help docs basically make recommendations on better blood pressure control, give them feedback on it. Uh, it's going to lead to better control. It's nice to see that it worked. Uh, this is a really interesting longitudinal study that looked at doctors, patients, all sorts of stuff across Sweden uh, for nearly a decade or over a decade. So really interesting intervention, a uh, big study. Um, it's nice to see, you know, things move in the right direction. Uh, and uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. Uh, it's nice to see QI, QI stuff that works in a meaningful way too. All right. Next up, we've got a brief research letter, a public opinion on firearm injury prevention proposals in California survey. Uh, so this is a research letter survey. Uh, they had 2,600 or nearly 2,600 um, participants in the California Safety and Wellbeing Survey in 2018. Uh, and the punchline is basically two main things. First, they asked them about an MC program uh, for people who turned in high capacity magazines um, and 62%. Uh, agreed that there should be complete amnesty. People could turn in these high capacity magazines, no questions asked, not go to jail for having these illegal magazines with high capacity. Um, and then the next one was on DUIs and future violence. So I'm just going to read from the study here. So after reading a definition of DUI and for a randomized subset of respondents, a statement about the association between DUI and risk of future violence, majorities of all of all page of all respondents, so 68%. Um, those living with firearm owners, 67%, and non-owners, or 72%, supported a law that prevents someone from buying a gun for five years if they have had two or more DOI convictions in five years. Um, half of firearm owners, 50%, actually on the nose, indicated support for such a law. Support did not vary significantly by self-reported alcohol use or by exposure to the statement about DUI and violence. Um, so really interesting stuff, basically, that uh, once again, we see very popular numbers across the board in surveys uh, that, that people generally have pretty uh, positive attitudes about reasonable approaches to uh, gun control to curb firearm injury. Um, going to welcome Alan Smute. We're moving quickly today because I'm by myself and not much to discuss, and I talk too fast. Uh, so we've got two more papers to talk about. Um, next up, the Association of Medicaid Expansion with Opioid Overdose Mortality in the U.S. So this is interesting. Uh, it's a serial cross-sectional study of 3,100 counties within uh, 49 states in D.C., missing one state, uh, from 2001 to 2017. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, not every state expanded Medicaid. Uh, and a number of states have chosen not to at this point. Um, and Medicaid expansion was associated with reductions in total op opioid overdose deaths. Um, uh, there's a, a little bit of heterogeneity here, and it's broken down in figure two. So overall, opioid, de opioid overdose deaths were down. Um, there's no si statistically significant difference in the natural and semi-synthetic opioid uh, overdose deaths. Um, there was a slight increase in methadone overdoses. Um, they note that the methadone overdoses are relatively rare compared to the rest, um, and this is probably related to increased methadone um, prescriptions because um, Medicaid expansion covers um, substance use uh, disorder and mental health services, so there's more, uh, there was more access to methadone, uh, which is an unfortunate side effect, but overall much more likely to be uh, preventing overall injury and death uh, than the methadone side effects. Um, and it's also interesting because the um, overall there's the uh, a pretty big 
seems to be a big shift in culture from methadone for substance use disorder to buprenorphine, as um, you know we've talked about uh, a lot before. Um, also, there um, uh, was also a, a protective association with synthetic opioids other than methadone, so basically fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, which we know is in a lot of um, uh, illicit drugs these days. So uh, not surprisingly, association Medicaid expansion with uh, lower rates of opioid overdose mortality in the U.S. Last paper for today, uh, this is an interesting one. Um, so this is the association between environmental factors and toxigenic cluster, uh, clusterioides, uh, difficile carriage at hospital admission. So this was at a uh, Milwaukee teaching hospital in southeast Wisconsin. They looked at 3,000 adult participants with non-hemonc-associated uh, C. diff. Um, and basically found that patients who live closer to livestock farms had higher rates of carrying toxigenic C. diff at the time of hospital admission, uh, which is really interesting to me. Uh, the table on uh, table three shows this, and you can see that the colonization rates um, were up to 16% in, pa in patients who were hospitalized and lived about one mile from a livestock farm. Um, uh, if they had a previous hospitalization, about 10%. If they didn't have a previous hospitalization, but as you go out for to 10 miles and 50 miles, those numbers drop by a fair amount. Um, so both being in the hospital previously and living closer to a farm uh, are apparently risk factors for toxigenic C. diff uh, colonization. So this colonization, not clinical disease, so an important distinction, um, but apparently being near cows uh, might be a risk factor for C. diff. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, Join us next week, as usual, uh, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Central Time, talk about some more papers. Uh, hopefully, I will not be alone that time, and you will not you just need to listen to me. Um, uh, follow us on the usual social media channels, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and YouTube at JAMA Network Open. And, uh, of course, you can listen to uh, the first paper on the podcast uh, at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else it is you get your podcasts. So thanks for joining in. Check out new articles tomorrow and Friday, 10 a.m. Central Time, GemmaNetworkOpen.com. Take care.